me to start by just talking about uh, a bit about what I think the principles of leadership are and then how the applications work and then take some questions. Um, the one thing I do know about leadership is that nobody really knows much, uh, honestly, about leadership. Uh, they're going to tell you all, uh, and they come in front of you, that they know the basic principles of leadership and uh, there'll be some agreement about some and disagreement about lots, but in truth, um, if you are in the situation of having to lead a group, an organization or something rather large, uh, quite a lot of this has to become pretty instinctive. So um, it's great we all have lots of lists of things, but at the end of the day, there's got to be something inside you uh, that uh, drives you towards that position of being able to make the right decisions, key decisions at the key times. But as I was being asked to come here, I did set down some basic thoughts about what I thought were uh, most of the ones that probably people would generally be agreed about that um, uh, that define the concept of leadership, uh, and I say the, the leadership rather than the leader. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, I think the first is that they're not in any order, by the way. So the first would be that um, one of the principles of leadership is to be able to uh, to lead by example. Uh, I'll come back to how that uh, it can be best demonstrated. Um, but uh, leading by example means that you are prepared where necessary to uh, to do the thing that you are asking others to do, or even sometimes the thing that they are reluctant to do. And you're prepared to step forward and do that where the need arises. Second is, whatever you are engaged in, uh, I felt that you need to show throughout a level of commitment to the objective and uh, the word passion is often used wrongly, but at least a, 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 that level of commitment even verging on the, a passion for the achievement of that objective. And that's, first of all, A, to the task in hand, uh, and uh, that commitment to achieving the objective also comes hand in glove with the commitment to the people that you are leading to achieve the objective. So in other words, there's nothing worse uh, in, uh, in, in the process if the people that work for you feel that they are, in a sense, your, your commitment to them is less than total. So they feel that you've asked them to do something, told them to do something, but in actual fact, you're probably not really 100% behind them when they come back with it. So when given a task to somebody, you need to show commitment to them, and then the passion needs to be able to transfer from you to them about the aim and achieving the aim, which is important. Uh, the second is you do need to have an uh, understanding about uh, delegation. Delegation, I often think, is arguably the most important part uh, of a process of leadership because if, you, if you're unable to delegate, what actually happens then is that you have a team that you lead or you're leading people uh, and it comes across as your inability to trust anybody in that team to do things. So you end up getting uh, all to yourself and then you bo get bogged down. And I've seen many uh, individuals in a leadership position who gets into what I call the micromanaging of everything around them to the point that they cannot see, to use that old expression, the wood for the trees. And the reason why that is because they're so engaged in every single technical detail that they fail, to re they fail themselves to, be able to lift their head up uh, and see what the aim is. And that's important because if your head isn't raised and your head is down, everybody else's head goes down with you because they themselves are not looking at the objective. You are the person that has to keep your eye on the aim and uh, the achievement of the aim for you is important and people need to understand what that is and keep being reminded of it. And if you're in the detail of what they're meant to be doing, then you're not going to be able to give them that kind of sense of direction. So delegation, giving people suited to the task, the job to do, and trusting them to do it, being hard on them if they don't achieve it, uh, but also being supportive as they achieve it, that's really important because you can't do all these jobs and you need to pick. And that comes down to... Uh, organizing uh, and structure, that is to say, you do make sure that you have the right people doing the right jobs. Uh, and I'll come back to how you face that sometimes as a problem, uh, but it does mean sometimes you have to be quite tough about saying to people, I'm sorry, but this is, you're just not the right person for this job and I'm going to have to get somebody else. You know, these are the difficult ends of leadership, but they're really important because if you delegate and somebody can't do the job, then the rest of the team fall apart with them. So it's very important constantly you need to understand whether people are achieving their own set of goals en route to achieving the overall goal. Um, the other one I wrote down was to, overall, people need to see you take ownership of the program and therefore be able to defend the nature of the work that they're doing. So in other words, when they come under attack, it's very important if they come in difficulties that you step up and you take that 
uh, position from them and for them. In other words, there are times when you have to be the person in the firing line because you're the person that you trust to be able to take that kind of difficulty. You don't let somebody else take that uh, as le uh, while you're leader. So it's a judgment call, but at some point you sometimes need to uh, to uh, front up to the whole issue if something's going wrong and take responsibility for it because you're responsible for them, even if when they make a mess. The other is obviously communication. You've got to be able to communicate, first of all, all your aims and objectives, and secondly, uh, how they achieve it, and to be in constant contact with everybody to make sure they understand fully what's going on. That requires you to be a good listener as much as it does as a good transmitter, as it were. Um, I've seen a lot of people who are really uh, almost constantly on transmit, uh, and things go wrong because they're not really listening. So if somebody has a good idea, uh, you have to listen to it. And you need to listen a lot sometimes. And that means sometimes you listen to people who tell you that somebody else is getting it wrong. You know, sometimes that's the only way you know that something isn't going right. So you need to listen a lot, keep your ear to the ground. And this is the whole point of constant reports coming back to you. You need to read those. That's another way of listening is to understand when you see something that doesn't look right, ask a question, get an answer back to it. Um, you must get to know those who work for you. I don't mean, by the way, that means being pally or chummy or, you know, just going out. Occasionally it might do, but generally my sense is you need their respect. But to get their respect, they need to understand that you know them enough to care what's going on, uh, and therefore they can come to you when they have a problem, and that's important. Um, you will need at some point to show some courage. <laughs> um, plenty of leaders who are leaders who often show no courage whatsoever. Um, and let others take the blame and things, and that I think is wrong. So leaders need to show some courage, even if it's courage on, in the event of ceasing to be a leader, you do need to take courage. And the final one, I think, is um, just have enough uh, skill and common sense in the course of listening to know when someone else knows more than you do and to recognize that moment and let them have their head. In other words, if they think there's a better way to do something, uh, uh, don't feel uh, in any way minimized by that. In fact, that's an art of being a good leader, is to recognize that sometimes the thing that you want to do isn't quite right, and there's a better way to do it. Well, listen to what they say, and if it works, embrace it, and then lead it. Uh, but the reality is you've just got to be prepared to recognize sometimes you aren't the smartest, best, and most able individual in the room. But that's true because you can't be all of those things necessarily. But what you can be is the person that marshals those skills and makes sure that the sum total of that uh, is more than the individual parts. And that's really, in essence, the part of being leader. So how does that manifest itself in general terms? Well, um, I've had to undergo various leadership moments, I suppose, when I was in the army, uh, which is different from business when I was in business. And then that, in turn, is different from when I've been um, uh, a leader of the Conservative Party, but uh, perhaps more latterly, a Secretary of State of a Department uh, of Government. So the principles much apply to all of those things. Maybe the form of it's slightly different. Uh, with the Army, when you're in, a, in an active service situation, things happen very fast, uh, and decisions uh, are being made at a speed which is different from, say, normal business life or anything else. You know, when I was on patrol in Northern Ireland during the, uh, some of the height of the Troubles, uh, when you've got um, uh, a patrol of what we used to call them bricks, which was basically four men patrols, and the platoon would be divided up into two halves, one half would be three, and the other half would be three patrols, uh, moving around through an urban environment, not sure who's following you, not sure uh, what waits around the corner for you. Um, uh, the role of the leader, the platoon commander, or his subordinate who runs the other half of the platoon, is to constantly know where people are, worry about them, recognize when the report's coming through that's difficult, and make snap decisions about getting them done, knowing full well that if you get it wrong, it could lead to uh, people getting into a situation where they could lose their lives, and recognizing that that uh, um, uh, would pose challenges of its own. So, so again, the principles remain, but... Um, uh, but there are issues around that which are very, very immediate and sudden. Um, you don't have a lot of the time when you're doing something like that that you might have if you're running a business or if you're running a department. So the, the principles are the same, but the speed with which you have to apply these ideas is, uh, is very good and is very fast. Let me give you an example. I was uh, a young patrol commander, platoon commander in Northern Ireland, and we were 
patrolling a place called the Bogside. Uh, I remember it quite well, and it was a very difficult area. The uh, uh, the um, the IRA were were pretty active in that area, and uh, it was only a couple of years after Bloody Sunday. So there was a there was a lot of antagonism and difficulty, and you used to get lots of uh, young kids that would tail your platoon, uh, and doing that would let whoever know where you were all the time. You never know whether that was because they were about to do something or they were keeping away from an area. And we were in the middle of a whole set of blocks of flats, these, these ghastly kind of 1950s, 60s flats, which had all sorts of little walkways and alleyways, and you could lose sight of two men in a, in a second. And we'd gone to take shelter for a second in a stairwell while I was trying to figure out where the other two ends of the patrol were, two other groups of patrol. Uh, and I remember, um, uh, I remember as we were standing in the corner there, I looked across to the bit below the stairwell, and I um, saw what looked to me like a peculiar pile of leaves and stuff. And uh, we'd had a few uh, booby traps uh, placed uh, recently, and I was puzzled a bit about this. And then I thought to myself, well, we should really have a look at that. And then a little nagging doubt in my mind said, what if you look at it and it turns out to be a booby trap and I put somebody in there and they get injured? So um, the other patrol had contacted somebody. I was in a, a you know, two-way process trying to figure this out. So I asked somebody at the patrol, go and, uh, I was only about 10 feet away, go and have a look at that. And he moaned at me. <laughs> he said, um, I don't really want to do that. And I said, do it, I'm right here, so just get it done, and just very carefully, just move the tops of the leaves away, and let's have a look. Uh, so there was a bit of tension at the moment, because we weren't quite sure what was going on, but as he uncovered it, more and more, he realized there was something in there, and it turns out that we found about 50 rounds of armor-piercing ammunition that was sitting underneath this pile of leaves, and what we had uncovered at that point uh, was what we call a temporary drop, so in other words, somebody, probably one of the young kids, had carried it to that point, a dead letterbox, dropped it, covered it, was moving away, we'd arrived just at the moment between somebody else picking it up and then dropping it. Uh, so in the end it turned out to be quite a remarkable find because armour-piercing rounds are dangerous because you would travelled around in armoured vehicles and they'd have gone straight through one of those and probably killed somebody. So who knows, ostensibly that might have saved lives. But the point really was there was a characteristic moment of decision where I had to decide to leave it alone or to do it and to risk our position because we were all literally crowded around it. Uh, and then you issue an instruction, you give them guidance, and they go and do it. It's just one example of how you commit to doing that. Um, beyond uh, the armed forces, and that was many years ago, I have to say, um, you know, work in uh, business was much the same. There's not a huge amount to talk about. The problem with business is you're always looking to reach the end point of your objective, which is uh, the company's uh, both cash flow and profitability. Uh, these things are uh, always get much more tighter focus as you get to your end of year before your finance reports, but running the team to developing a whole program to improve all of that means that you're going to hit moments where everyone panics and wants to change something and do something, and it's very difficult sometimes. But if I bring you fast forward to uh, running a department, I took over a department that was uh, is probably about a third of all government expenditure, so that's um, spending something in the order of about £167 billion pounds a year. Uh, it cost about uh, £10 billion pounds to run. <coughs> and uh, welfare needed massive reform. Uh, so we had to structure the team to do a whole series of changes and reforms, whether it was the thing I was doing with universal credit or whether it was the changes made to the employment processes and the programs like the work program. It was building a team, setting that team off to do the job, overseeing them and watching them. Although you had subordinate ministers to make sure they ran most of those things, the truth is you needed to have it on your desk regularly. So. I decided the only way to understand this was to organize it so that uh, every weekend I got a report on each of the key areas of reform, and there were a lot of them, summarized by them with all the warts as well, so the problems and the difficulties. Uh, it's what you have to learn the hard way because uh, things move so quickly and you lose sight of them. And the second was uh, to, uh, uh, to get people to commit to this idea of reform and change, and actually in due course they duly did. And so many of them were coming up with innovative ideas how to change that and freeing people up. But the biggest problem you face uh, is delegation and the skill of the individuals you delegate to. Uh, and very rapidly you suddenly come to the conclusion, as I did often, uh, that the individuals that were responsible for running these were simply not good enough. Um, and uh, there is a decision to be made about moving somebody. 
uh, when you know that is a difficult moment for them and it's a, 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 a difficult moment for somebody as a leader but if you don't do it what you can see is the program itself isn't going anywhere uh, and if that's the case then it is you at the end of the day that will carry the burden of blame and therefore you have to make sure that the person in the post doing that is the right person during the course of the time of the department I had to do that on quite a number of occasions um, because at the ultimately you have to report on that so you take some particular t tough decisions um, uh, but you must show the courage to, to do those decisions and other times uh, being responsible standing in front of the dispatch box in the House of Commons when everybody's shouting and hurling abuse at you because they think that you've got something wrong uh, that's where you have to step up in politics as a, a politician you have to carry that whole program and it is you that is at the dispatch box not the person who got it wrong or not the people that got it wrong it is you that will answer for that even if there is no defense to not knowing or not realizing uh, it is you that takes the responsibility it's in a more immediate way than uh, in business uh, no businessman has to go in front of a dispatch box and stand in front of a baying mob uh, but that is the nature of what you do in politics. But it is it's the same principle, just much more immediate. So uh, all in all, uh, those basic principles I've given you, I hope are some help to you. Uh, but um, uh, these things have to be applied by you. And the only point I make in passing about leadership is very simply that um, everybody has a different style about how they do it. Some people are quite autocratic about it uh, and like to have things absolutely laid out in a sort of linear sense. Others are more relaxed uh, and uh, have enough self-confidence to recognize that these lines are sometimes blurred over how you work, but you have to translate that to uh, and apply them to the conditions at the time. Uh, it's only up to you how you do that, but you'll be rapidly found out if you're uh, in a leadership position and you don't genuinely give any leadership, uh, then people will recognize in due course that that program or that thing that you're doing starts to drift, it doesn't go right, it starts to go wrong, uh, and then people will assume it's because you failed to take the responsibility for the right action, and thus your leadership of that program wasn't good enough. So you'll have to find your own way and style of doing it, but the principles remain much the same, uh, and ultimately uh, the most important thing for a leader is to have courage. Uh, if you lack courage, then you cannot be a leader. Uh, you have to have the courage to stand alone. It's a lonely place to be sometimes, uh, the courage to believe that what you're doing is right and the thing that you're doing and the way that it's working is the right way. If you believe that, you have to have the courage to stand up to do that and sometimes defy the rest of the world uh, to get it done. If you believe strongly enough it's right, then you'll find most great programs, most great things, most in politics or in business, uh, were, were, were done by people who made that decision. Uh, and I ended up changing things dramatically because they saw what it should look like and others could not see that. That's quite difficult sometimes, but leading through that process is what you're ultimately meant to do as a leader. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, we've got about 20 minutes to do our Q&A, so we're going to try to get as many questions in as we can. And um, then we'll leave a bit of time at the end for, the, for a quick picture of chat. So the first piece will be brief this time, the first few questions. Uh, hello, Mr. Ian Duncan Smith. No, 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 just, 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 just say Mr. Duncan Smith or Ian or whatever. Don't go with the right honourable stuff. <laughs> you sure? Yeah, absolutely certain. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for your time. My name is VJ, um, and my question is: What would you say are the key key arguments for both leaving and staying in the EU? Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> uh, moving on very swiftly. Uh, well, let me start with uh, those who argue to remain in the European Union. Uh, it seems to me do so from a, the standpoint mostly of the worry that others might have about what the world looks like if you leave the European Union. In fact, there's only really one argument they make, which is if you leave the European Union, uh, it could be an awful lot worse. Um, so that is the argument being mounted. I would guess that's the... Uh, you know, you might uh, say it's worse economically, you might argue that it's worse uh, in your relationships with others in the European Union, and ultimately one of the original arguments, although this has turned out to um, have not been a very strong argument, is that somehow security would be worse. Uh, but in essence, it's a, there's a lovely Hilaire Belloc poem. I don't know if you've ever read much poetry, but if you get a chance to read uh, some very funny poetry by Hilaire Belloc about a young girl or young boy, I can't remember, who goes off to the zoo with, in those days, their nanny, and uh, uh, 
basically gets eaten <laughs> by one of the animals. And the final line is, uh, hang on to nurse for fear of something worse. Um, and uh, that seems to me the basic argument uh, for remaining in the EU, which is, you know, we've got here so far, you know, we don't think it's great, but, you know, being outside it would be worse. On the other side, the Leave campaign, uh, it's almost the exact opposite, which is, no, it's not working, uh, and it's in a state of decline. You know, the Eurozone itself is almost marred, most of Europe in a almost quasi-permanent recession with unemployment and youth unemployment at appalling levels, uh, that this in itself means that the uh, European Union as a marketplace for the rest of the world is shrinking, uh, and that in essence, therefore, tying yourself to something which is shrinking, which stops you interacting with the rest of the world to the degree you'd like to. For example, we can't sign our own trade treaties. Uh, we'd have probably had a treaty by now with India. We'd have a treaty with Japan. You know, historic friends, we'd have a treaty certainly with the United States, but we haven't because the European Union, being 27 nations, can't agree what they want, so the lowest common denominator prevails. So, so the idea is that you'd be able to trade with people, and most importantly, that uh, the borders to the European Union are wide open, but the borders to the rest of the world are, are um, controlled. And so far better to have controlled borders, so you look for skills that you want in, not just people want to come in and do whatever job, and we've still got people in the UK looking for jobs. So. First of all, taking control of your borders. Secondly, getting control of the money that you send, 20 billion over there, keeping it in the UK. And the third one uh, is, in, in essence, I suppose, uh, being part of a, a global economy where you can uh, invest and trade to a much greater degree. Um, can I be written with three names? And uh, please feel, feel comfortable to address the speakers, Mr. Uh, Duncan Smith. So, you've got Dorian and Mr. Smith. I think we actually um, covered quite a few the top quality I said earlier on is courage I think without courage it's difficult to see how you lead if you lack courage you can't really be a leader doesn't mean to say you can't uh, uh, be a follower you can certainly you know do good jobs and be skilled but not necessarily be a leader there are plenty of people that are brilliant engineers or scientists etc who don't lead teams but they're very good at what they do and it's finding that level. If you want to lead, though, you must have the courage to be able to step out in front, to take the responsibility and to lead on. So courage without question in my book. I just want to say thank you for joining us today. Pleasure. Um, and my question is, do you think leadership skills can be taught, or do you think that there's something which is just kind of innate deep within us? Uh, I think they can be taught, mm -hmm. but whether or not you're capable of applying them is another matter altogether. As I said earlier on, I think people, uh, you know, you will only know whether you can lead when you've confronted the, the responsibility of leading something. Uh, and uh, I remember when I joined the army, we had to go through these, uh, I don't know what they're called now, battlefield tests or something, where you were given a series of problems to solve, practical problems, crossing a river with three other people, you've got a rope and a couple of oil cans or something, and something else. And you were given these tasks. and for each task, one of you becomes the leader of the group. Uh, and it's always quite funny for the people watching it to watch what people get engaged in. They're not actually looking to see whether or not you got them across the river. They're looking to see how you operated the group to get the project done, or as far done as you can possibly manage. And um, uh, <laughs> you often see groups with somebody who clearly uh, doesn't have that same sense of presence and you know, the ability to lead just descend into complete chaos in the middle of the task when something isn't. They start out with a brilliant idea, they start doing it, everyone has a task, suddenly it doesn't go quite right, and then you've got some bloke balancing on an all drum in an ostensibly in the middle of a river and other people standing on one side uh, not knowing what to do and it just all ends, your time finishes and you're out. Whereas if you watch the people that are really good, as I said earlier on, you know, what happens is they, they have the task, they sit down, what do we think? I think we could do this, da, da, da. you quickly decide or agree whose plan is best as the leader. You then say, right, we're going to do this. Your task is this, this, and this. On you get. Halfway through, it's not really working. Uh, and uh, th that's not a problem because the key thing about the leadership at that point is the leader, somebody says, I think if we did it this way or that way, the leader says, right, okay, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to change that. We're going to do this. Now you go and do this, you do that, and they start the process. So the good guys were the ones constantly looking for, you know, if it wasn't quite working, what do you do next? Not standing there 
or issuing orders simply because they're in charge. The trick was use the skill of your group and then leverage that to be able to get the job done, but make sure everyone is doing something, not just everyone descends into chaos. And it was quite interesting to watch the different groups that went through where you know, somebody with real qualities of leadership applied these principles that I talked about and got them either across or certainly they looked like they would have been across you know, the river or whatever, and others, as I say, that just descended into sometimes quite funny chaos, really, but um, not for them anyway. I don't believe in thick skins. I don't think they exist. I don't think a politician's skin is any thicker than yours. Um, and I'd love to know that you were loved one day and hated the next. It's the love bit that really I think politicians <laughs> will find themselves mostly without. But uh, that notwithstanding, I don't. everyone says, oh, politicians, you must have a very thick skin. You don't. The difference is you just have to learn the hard way how to deal with criticism. And there's a lot of it. Everybody knows how you should do your job better than you do. I mean, any meeting you ever go to, somebody knows exactly. Somebody always knows one thing. And they're going to tell you that incessantly, whether it doesn't matter what it is, uh, you know, you got this wrong, you should have done it this way, because they don't have to think about all the consequences elsewhere. They think only about doing the one thing, because that's the only thing that matters to them, and everything else goes by the board. The trouble with being a politician is you have to kind of cover a whole series of events and issues and get the balance right, knowing full well that if it's just a spending issue, but where does the money come from and all this balance. If you've got one issue, you don't really think about that. So uh, it's, it's difficult. And the criticism... You know, media criticism, criticism of your colleagues. There's no place like the House of Commons for being criticised. I mean, that is pretty full on. Uh, it's, uh, it can be at times fairly barbaric, but it's, it's the nature of the game. And I don't think it's kids thing. So I just think you have to learn to deal with it. Lots of different ways you recognise. One of the ways is don't read it. Uh, honestly, you know, as somebody once said to me, a columnist, well, they're paid to write articles about other people They've never done any of it themselves, but they're always critical about you. But if you read it, it bothers you. It takes your mind off. So I've always taken the principle, by and large, unless it's really, really important. Don't read it, good or bad. If it's bad, it makes you think about it a lot, makes you miserable and starts to make you not so effective. And if it's good, it does exactly the same, but a different way around. What it does is it makes you think, oh, that was all right, I'm doing all right. Puffs you up a bit and you're heading for a fall. So the trick is just, as I said earlier on, know what your objective was. Believe that you know that you're right. If you're not, then you shouldn't be doing it. But if you do believe there's a way through and you want to get it done, and then have the courage to see it through. And you'll be surprised how many people that are critical, because that's all they want to write is criticism, ultimately, uh, later on, as and when you get it right or it's going right, will be the first to say, well, you see, you know, it was all, I always was sure that it was right. As they say, newspapers and columnists can change their minds in 24 hours and nobody remembers it. A politician changes their mind in 24 hours, he's called a hypocrite. So uh, there's a big difference. But thick skin, no, it hurts. It always hurts, but you just don't show it. You must never show it, because that means they all say, oh, now time to follow through. So just you just keep your head on the objective. Thank you. Um, so we would you like to take three questions, and then you can ask them in the first. Yep, sure. So first, we can ask you to ask you. Thank you very much. What were the three top challenges you faced while serving the You should repeat that because I was half writing down the other one. Yep. <laughs> um, given your experience serving in government and as a member of the opposition, do you believe that politics is the only way to create positive change, or do you think there are other methods to do so? Okay, uh, the three top. This is quite a difficult one. The three top challenges, because um, they're all very, very different. Uh, leader of the Conservative Party, I inherited a party that had just lost two elections. Um, and uh, didn't appear to be going anywhere in the polls, uh, and by and large uh, was kind of static. Uh, but worse than that, actually, it was a party that had been kind of at war with itself for a while, uh, post Mrs. Thatcher's departure, the Conservative Party was 
uneasy uh, and very, you know, those factions in the party had not settled since then. It was, you know, the, it always happens after somebody as uh, dynamic and as, as big in political terms as that, whether it, you go back into history, the toppling of a king or a queen or whatever, or prime minister, these things always have repercussions. You know, people don't, people remember what somebody else did and this goes on. So the party itself was ill at ease with itself um, and had got quite narrow in its focus, therefore, about only a few things that it wanted to talk about. Uh, and so I felt my job was, first of all, to try and settle it down. The second thing was to broaden its outlook um, and to try and refocus it on areas that it has not been considered to be involved in, but areas that were important to it. Uh, in fact, I followed through after that with setting up the Centre for Social Justice because uh, I was convinced that was right. But in the time that I had, uh, it was very difficult, to be quite frank with you, and uh, getting the party to that point. Until the party decided that it really, really wanted to be in government more than anything else, then it's very difficult to get it to focus on that. So those are the main challenges. But in the department, it's different, completely different, because you now are in government, and therefore you have power. You have no power as the opposition, really, except for debates and things, but you don't have power to run things. Government is about running things. So that ma those challenges are different. They're the challenges of, you know, when I make a decision, uh, things have to happen and be done. So your challenges are getting the right people to do the job, to get the focus right and the objective clear, and actually drive those things forward. And we had a few problems at the beginning with um, uh, uh, the department over one particular program setting out on a course of action which very shortly I began to realize, I thought to myself, did not seem like it would work, and I hadn't been in the department very long. I indicated an internal review, but by outside people, and they confirmed that opinion to me later, and we had to readjust that program massively and change it. It's still going now, but I had to take responsibility for that. It was a very difficult period. Uh, so those challenges are about making sure things you want to do get done and are delivered on against objectives and needing to step in occasionally, even though it's going to cost you uh, political terms is important. Um, that, those are the three kind of areas of challenge. Um, how much do you have to influence people? Uh, who's asking that question? Yeah, uh, how much do you influence people on it within government and uh, within the cabinet? Was that right? Yeah, well, that's exactly what it's about, I'm afraid, because lots of things you do overlap with other government departments. I actually chaired a thing called the, S the Social Justice Cabinet Committee, which we created, which was to try and bring all the departments together at this meeting to decide and agree what we were doing that overlapped with each other. Uh, and that helped enormously, actually. But you're still in negotiation. I'll give you a very good example. I, I was going around uh, some job centres uh, endlessly, and I keep coming across people who uh, couldn't get certain jobs, um, and at the same time I knew there were labour shortages in certain key areas. One of them was heavy goods vehicle driving. Now, I did an HTV course after I left the army to be a lorry driver. I know you're saying, how did it all go downhill from there? But, uh, but the, uh, the point is that, um, so I know a little bit about heavy goods vehicle driving and how long it took me. It took me two weeks to do the course, and I got an HGV2 license at the end of it, and I loved every minute of it, actually. But uh, the point I was making was, I looked at this, and I talked to my guys, and I said, this is a bit ridiculous. We've got an absolute shortage in the UK of heavy goods vehicle drivers. Actually, it's a good career, it's a good salary, you, you know, it's well paid and, you know, it, it is really worth doing. It, it takes um, two weeks to train a heavy goods vehicle driver, so you need someone to have a driver's license and then you can train them to be a heavy goods vehicle driver. <clears throat> and I said, why don't we, you know, what is to stop us getting it? And they said, oh, well, the cost of the program is about £3,000. I said, why does it cost £3,000 to train a heavy goods vehicle driver? And also the commitment and the companies didn't want to commit to that because people might go and they wouldn't stay with them and then they might fail and all the rest of it. So I authorised one of the job centres to use some of our flexible money that we had to actually buy a series of courses to see how we could do this and drop the price on it. And we did all of that and they showed that once they were working with them, their, their failure rate was much lower. So they were going through at a higher rate. So I then used that to sit down with the transport secretary and the business secretary and say, can we just look at this again? You know, let's get the price down on this. Let's get the businesses <clears throat> to commit to having to pay for training. But on the basis that all that's going to happen is that if somebody then has to commit in turn to do a number of years or whatever with that company, because otherwise they'd have to pay the money back. And I said, once you do that, there's no risk to the company. And on the failure risk, we can show that as long as we're involved managing it, failure rate's so low that they actually wouldn't have a problem with it. 
So that was one of the later things that I did, and we started to get the process going, and I'm hoping, I don't know if it has yet, but that will then result in an outcome where we will then be able to offer training for people to be heavy goods vehicle drivers instead of bringing people in from overseas to be heavy goods vehicle drivers when we've got plenty of people sitting in our employment who actually do it. And so that's the kind of thing that you negotiate around because you, have, you, sense, you don't think, it's not my job, because all the department said, that's not our job to do it. I said, I don't care whose job it is. Let's get the department over there, the transport department. Let's get the business department. Let's have that meeting, flash it out. And hopefully that will, that will work. I'll say that with a bit of ignorance, because I decided to step down from the government a few weeks ago, so I'm not quite sure where that's gone, but I think it should be pretty good. Uh, no, is the answer to that question. <laughs> it's not. Um, depends what you're trying to achieve. Government is by its very nature broad, so you're dealing with the running of the country and the securing of the country, and therefore that means an awful lot of stuff going on, and of course it is a way to achieve lots of different things uh, if you're clear and focused and you want to achieve it. It's not the only way though, because there are lots of single issue people who are specialists who aren't in government who campaign on things, so there are lots of campaigners who will campaign on stuff and will help persuade government to change. So. You know, the question is who, who is more important in that regard. I think, I guess, it's a chain reaction of people. But as a campaigner, you can get things changed. Sometimes you can't, uh, and government has to make decisions. And you know, that's the priorities that they set. But, but no, it isn't. But if you want to change things and do things, and you want to be, you know, you want to run your country and be part of that process, then being in government is the only thing. But not if you want to change things. Can you just repeat that again? Quite here. Yeah. Um, uh, my question is: As the leader of the opposition, how much control do you have in shaping the views and policies of your party? Uh, right, okay, very quickly <clears throat> from one to the other. Uh, what challenges? Leader of the opposition is arguably one of the most difficult things that you will do in politics if you happen to be doing it. The very simple reason that you are in this invidious position of being in the public eye with the media circling around the whole time, uh, expecting you to offer the alternative because you're the opposition. So you are the official opposition. That's why it's always called Her Majesty's official opposition. There are other opposition parties, but you are the opposition. It's unusual; doesn't happen in lots of countries. But here, there, you know, you have a you have a status as the leader of the opposition. Uh, and so, for the most part, that's going to be Labour or Conservatives in our past politics. Not to say that it won't one day change, but that's basically where it is. The problem you've got is that you are, as leader of the opposition, apparently meant to be the alternative prime minister. The difference is, a prime minister in the government is surrounded by a civil service plus their own special advisors, and they can afford to have reasonably high quality, but certainly a much bigger structure. They have much more going on for them. They, you know, huge teams of people all the time. They've got myriads of economists working away. When they ask for stuff, it gets done. You know, it's very satisfying in some senses because, you know, it's a process of achievement. The leader of the opposition uh, actually has a very little... <laughs> He has mostly volunteers and people that he pays for, but an awful lot of people who are drawn from, therefore, that political belief, which means you're limited sometimes in your skill levels in certain areas, so you have to put up with that less a bit. The second thing is you don't run something, so you're always reacting. And when you then want to produce policy, what happens is the first thing is the government will then immediately attack it because they have greater resources and can often rip things apart. So there's a balance of knowing that. And the last great challenge is you have to manage your party, which is a bit that somebody once said, like herding cats. I mean, the people who are m members of the parliament are very individualistic. Uh, they often think they know better than everybody else. Uh, 
It's debatable whether they do, but they think they do most of the time. And the result is they're a bit like sort of self-employed individuals. You know, they're there because they collect together collectively to follow your leadership, but in opposition, their tenacity and your support is not as great as it might be, say, in government. Because in government, you have what's called patronage. And you know what I need by patronage, which means that, uh, you know, if I think you're a really good bloke, I could end up giving you, uh, nominating you for some kind of award or uh, giving you a government job that you, you know, you minister or something if you want to do, which somebody wants to do, or maybe one day um, getting you knighted or something like that, you know, it goes across the country, but also political awards. So what the government has patronage because at the end of the day they have to dispose of things, so that's what happens. Opposition leader has absolutely nothing. So keeping control of your party is mostly by persuasion, and persuading them sometimes can be incredibly difficult, particularly if they dislike you intensely, which is often the case. So um, it's, uh, uh, if you ask Tony Blair or uh, you know, Margaret Thatcher, if she's alive, or anybody else, they will always tell you that being leader of the opposition is the most difficult job you can do in politics because you are surrounded by critics uh, with not very many people to help support you and you live in hope that the government itself can be made to be unpopular because otherwise, basically, you will remain leader of the opposition. And it's the one job you ever have in life that you don't really want. What you actually want is the other job across the way, which is called being prime minister. Uh, so, you know, no one remembers at the end of it all Great leaders of the opposition, by and large not, because they didn't make it to be prime minister. They only ever remember great leaders of the opposition who became prime minister, and that's the nature of the game. So it's the one time when you run something and lead something, when you actually publicly and openly wish you were doing something else. Uh, how much do the leader of the opposition, oh no, um, control do they have? Uh, well, I think the answer is somewhere in that, not a lot. Uh, persuasion mostly is what they've got and uh, trying to get the public on your side, but also your own party to focus and to deliver as one. So a limited amount of time. And to what degree does uh, being a leader of the opposition get in the way of your own beliefs? Sometimes massively, yeah, yeah. You have to compromise a lot because you've got to get this group of MPs and the party at large around the country to coalesce around your views, which means you, know, you compromise quite a lot you sometimes take arbitrary decisions and hope that they'll follow you, uh, and often you sometimes have to modify those as well. It's not easy um, because you're under attack from pretty much everybody, but uh, you, you should have a core belief, and I think if you lead, you must have a belief in politics, uh, in certain things, and if you have that belief, then at least you have a compass by which to steer, even occasionally you have to, instead of going due south, go southwest by west, and then eventually south again, but you have to Keep your eye on the compass the whole time, and if you don't have an inbuilt compass, uh, then you can almost end up anywhere, and that's not really leadership at that point. That's about following. Ladies and gentlemen, please show your appreciation to the right honourable. <laughs>